Would you stand with us as we sing to our resurrected Savior? resurrection of our Lord Jesus this morning. We have reason to celebrate. This is the hope in which we stand, church. If Jesus is not risen from the grave, all hope would be lost, and we come into this room to celebrate who he is. So come, join us in song as we continue to sing together.
undone, hallelujah. Jesus has won, hallelujah. We overcome, oh, in Jesus, oh, in Jesus.
together. Indeed, Jesus, we can face this life because we have a hope in you. Because you, when you died, that was not the end, but through the power of God, you were raised to life. So God, we praise your name. We thank you for the love and grace that you have lavished upon us in kindness through Jesus. And I pray that as we reflect upon your word now, that that would fill us with gratitude and thankfulness that we may worship you and proclaim your name to the world. We love you, we praise you. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and happy Easter to you. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. So my question for you is, big deal. Why does it matter? There's a, an article I was reading, it was a study that was released at the end of last year. It asked that question, why does Easter matter? And here's what this research found. At the end of last year, 66% of Americans believe in the literal and physical life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 66% of Americans believe in the reality of Jesus' life and the reality of his death and the reality of his resurrection. And some of you might be saying, gosh, Brian, 66%, that's kind of low. Personally, I was shocked. I, mean, I, I feel like that's pretty good. And, and, and here's the thing, let me break it down in terms of our, our nation, our country. So in the South, 
right? What I call New California, where all the old Californians moved, right? Texas, Tennessee, Florida, Arizona, all those places, 70%, 70% of those areas, of people in those areas, believe in the literal life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Kooky, California, 60%. Like again, to me, I'm like, wow, that's, that's a majority of people in California who believe in the literal life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, here's the thing that's shocking. Although there's a majority of people who believe in the literal life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, over 60% said, we don't know why it matters. Over 60%, hey, Brian, we believe that Jesus lived, that he died, that he rose again. Big whoop. Who cares? Why should that matter? See, here's what I say. I think the church and I think Christians have been hitting the the truth button so hard that Jesus lived that we've forgotten to tell them why it's so important. And that's what I'd love to just remind you of today. Not just that Jesus did live, that he did die for sins, that he did rise again, but why it matters. Why it matters to me, why it should matter to you. And I want to get this right, and so I decided instead of writing my own sermon, I'm going to steal someone else's. I know you might be shocked, like, oh, Brian, I... Listen, this is one of the world's greatest preachers of all time. You won't find him on TV. He hasn't written any books. He's not on the radio. He doesn't have a podcast. He's not online but he has written a lot of letters and he's written a lot of sermons. His name is the Apostle Paul and you can find his sermon, lucky for us, in scripture. So if you brought your Bibles, you can join me in the book of Acts, chapter 13. I wanna share a sermon of the Apostle Paul with you. It's a sermon that the Apostle Paul shared with, with I believe, people just like you. It was a setting where good people who loved God came together to be reminded of his truth, reminded of his power. But Paul went in assuming that many of them didn't know the importance of Easter. If you're here today, you're thinking, shoot, Brian, I knew I forgot something. I forgot my Bible. That's okay. You can download the Chino Valley Community Church app. Just go to your favorite app store, look for Chino Valley Community Church. If you wanna just scan the QR code, you can do that too. Down at the bottom is a Bible icon, click that. If you wanna follow along with me, I use the New American Standard Bible. There's different versions in there, pick what you like. Um, But if you don't have a Bible or you'd rather use one on your screen, you can use the Chino Valley Community Church app. So in your Bibles, join me, Acts chapter 13. Listen to how Paul started. So in verse 17, he said this. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all of my will. First thing, Paul begins this sermon helping you understand that God has a plan. God has always had a plan. From the very beginning, God has had this plan. Many of you know that I I grew up, my grandfather was a pastor. My grandfather would always tell me, if you want to make sure that you see the activity of God, don't look forward. Don't look before you. You're going to see twists and turns and peaks and valleys. If you want to see the activity of God, don't look forwards. It's so hard to see the activity of God when you look at the future. All you get is anxious, fearful, and worried. If you want to have confidence and see the activity of God, look behind you. Look how God has walked with you and provided for you. 
and protected you through the twists and turns of your life. And that's the exact same way Paul starts his sermon. He says, the people of God, the God of this people, Israel, and it begins all the way with him choosing Israel. He said he chose our fathers and made the people great. God chose Israel. The beginning of his plan is he chose them. He handpicked them. And it wasn't because they were the greatest. It wasn't because they were the biggest. It wasn't because they were richest. In fact, God picked them because they were the least. They're the weakest. Look at what he said in Deuteronomy. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you are more in number than any of the peoples for you are the fewest of all the peoples but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your fathers the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh the king of Egypt. And God said, I didn't choose you like my plan all the way back when I chose you. I didn't choose you because you were the greatest. I chose you because you were the weakest. If I wanted to demonstrate my power, if I wanted to demonstrate who I was, I wanted to do it through you. Not only did I choose you when you were weakest, but I made the people great. He lifted them up above all others. He elevated them beyond what they could have ever achieved on their own. God says, think about this. You want to know my plan? I picked you when you were nothing. And I lifted you up to where you were everything. So especially when you're in the land of Egypt, remember that? When they were in the land of Egypt, God blessed them and grew them to such number the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, got worried. And so he enslaved them. And so Paul continues, he said, and with an uplift, uplifted arm, he led you out from it. Remember how God provided for their escape and their deliverance from slavery, those 10 miraculous plagues. God said, I led you out. And remember how he did it. As they were going through the desert, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, I said, I've had a plan this entire time for when I chose you, I lifted you up, I made you great. When you were enslaved, I freed you. When you were wandering through the desert, I led you. Look at verse 18, he says, for a period of about 40 years, I put up with you in the wilderness. Man, you wanna know God's plan, even despite all of your failures, all of your whinings, all of your failures, all of your weaknesses, all of your idolatry, I put up with you. Verse 19, I paved the way for you in the promised land and I distributed the land as an inheritance. I gave you, I gave you a home. I gave you an inheritance, riches that you didn't deserve, that you could have never attained on your own. Verse 20, after these things, God gave them judges. I gave you leaders, and prophets. You asked for a king, I gave you one. You were tired of following me, you wanted a king like everyone else, I gave you that. When that guy didn't work out, I gave you another one. I gave you David, one of the greatest kings of Israel. Listen, within that passage, God describes his activity 12 different times. Listen, I've had a plan, God said, from the very beginning when I called you, I've had a plan. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. Man, people of God, you're nothing without me, God says. I even gave you David, a man after my own heart. It's always been a plan, every good thing that has been a part of your life, Paul says. God has given it to you. It's the same thing that James, the brother of Jesus said. Look at what James said, James 1:17. He said, every good thing given in every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God has a plan. I know sometimes when you're in the midst of it looking forward, it doesn't look like God has a plan. I know in the midst of the craziness of your culture or the drama of your family, it feels like God doesn't have a plan. Paul says, look backwards. 
God has always had a plan. From the time he chose you, he chose you for a reason. He has built you up. He has protected you. He has delivered you. He has gifted you. He has empowered you. Why? Ever wonder why God would do all that? Look at verse 23. From the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought Israel a savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, surprise, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. God, Paul says, you want to know why all of this plan is happening? It's because of the promise that God made. I say, what promise? God's made a ton of promises in Scripture. What promise is he talking about? He's talking about the promise in Genesis 3. You remember that? Right after Adam and Eve sinned, brought sin and death upon us all, God made a promise that a descendant of Eve would come and deliver us from the evil one. How about Genesis 12, where God chose Abram, who was nothing, Abraham, I choose you. I'm going to make you a blessing to the entire world. Abraham, follow me. And I will bless every nation. I will bless everyone through you. Then we see this in 2 Samuel 7. Describing the Messiah, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever look at what the prophet isaiah said isaiah 9 says this for a child will be born to us a son will be given to us the government will rest on his shoulders his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty god eternal father prince of peace there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of david and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And look at what Gabriel said to Mary that first Christmas. He says, and behold, that term behold, surprise. Anytime you see the word behold in the Bible, circle it because it means don't miss this. This is good news. This is something that should just excite you. Behold, surprise. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great. will be called the son of the most high. The Lord, will, Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Man, Paul wants to make sure that you recognize that God has always had a plan to fulfill his promise. Promise of providing a savior, a deliverer. Can I ask you something? Do you know God still has a plan? God still has a plan and he's working it out in our day, in our culture. I know that people tell you that this is the kookiest time it's ever been in the world. It's not true. God has been continually at work within the darkness of humanity, no matter what aspect of brokenness in culture, God has always found a way to shine through and God continues to do that with you. If you want to see God's activity in your life, don't look frontwards. Don't look before you. All you'll see are are twists and turns and peaks and valleys. Look behind you. And you'll see God working. You see how he's protected, how he's provided, how he's guided. 2 Peter 3.9 gives us a promise. He says, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Oh, what plan is God doing now? What God, what is God doing in your life? What is God doing in our time? A term wish in that passage means to will, to intend, to deliberately be at work for a particular reason. Man, God is still at work. He still has a plan. He's still moving not just in our culture, but around the world and in your life. First thing Paul says in the sermon, you gotta understand something. God has a plan. 
He's had a plan from the very beginning and he has been working his plan. I know from your vantage point, it seems like God's taken forever. But Peter said in 2 Peter 3, God's version of time and your version of time are different. A day is like a thousand, a day of God's is like a thousand years to us. Your perspective of time is different than his. I mean, God has always been working a plan and is still working a plan for you. Paul continues, he says, first thing you gotta know, number one, God has a plan, but second, you gotta know Easter matters. And listen to how he describes it. He says, verse 26 then, he goes in, he says, brother and son of Adam's family and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. You wanna know why Easter matters? Easter is the culmination of the promise. Everything that God has been working to build and prepare all came together on Easter. Look at how he continues. He says, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which were read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God, man, that's one of my favorite phrases in scripture. But God, just when you think everything is lost, that all of God's plans and all of God's promises have been thwarted, but God, my two favorite words, number one, the big biblical but, just when you think everything that, that man has used for evil, God has flipped the script. That term but, the big biblical but, it's given us, it's a per, uh, biblical term to tell us that we're changing direction. Just when you think that you're going that way, but God intervenes. Just when everyone thought that Satan had won, look at verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. What man intended for evil, God used for good. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And look what he says, verse 32. He says, and we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus, as is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son today, I've begotten you. Paul says, so today I wanna preach to you why Easter matters. A term preach. We proclaim, we announce, we're going through life declaring. You want to know my purpose? Paul says, I am here to proclaim and to announce to you the good news. Easter is good news. It should be celebrated. Man, we should dress up. We should bring the family together. We should come together as a church. We should celebrate the plan of God that he's been orchestrating from the beginning has been completed. And Easter, we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that promise that God made. Verse 33, God has fulfilled it. Fulfilled, that term means God has caused it to happen. He has accomplished what he said he would do. The term fulfilled actually means to fill a vessel completely to the brim, like there is no room for anything else for God to do. God has completely finished his promise, everything that he started to do from the beginning of time, God has fulfilled and completed in Easter. Man, why do we celebrate Easter? It's more than just the reality of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, but it's what Jesus did, or it's what God fulfilled and completed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Why does Easter matter? It's the evidence of the completion of God's promise. Salvation has come. Everything that God has been at work in building up to culminates at Easter. And everything after Easter continues to be a blessing fulfillment of what he did at Easter. So here's his final point. Paul says this, 
It says, God has a plan. Easter matters. Finally, you have a choice. You have a choice. This is everything God has done. He has fulfilled his promise. He has fulfilled what he ded dedicated himself to do. He has provided this path for you. God has a plan. Easter matters because Easter is where he finished it. Look at verse 38 then. Therefore, because of everything that Paul said up in front of that, therefore, because of God's plan, because of why Easter matters, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. And I love it. Paul could have given a message. These people, you want hope. See, these people grew up in a, in a climate of political corruption. Paul could have entered into that time and says, hey, you want to know the plan of God? God's going to do this great political movement. He didn't. Man, they grew up in a time where there's immorality throughout their culture. He could have come and said, listen, this is the movement of God. He's going to clean up culture. That's not what he said. Man, they live in a time where there was divorce and family drama. Paul could have come and said, you want to know the blessing of Easter? Jesus is going to make your family all get along. That's not what he said. You want to know God's plan? What he's been building from the very beginning? What he was weaving in and out of history to accomplish for you? It wasn't a political movement. It wasn't a familiar movement. It wasn't even a cultural movement. It was a spiritual one. I say, you want to know why Easter matters? You want to know everything that God has been working to provide for you? Forgiveness of sins. A term forgiveness. God has bought you deliverance from your sins. He's provided a pardon for your trespass. He has dismissed the case of judgment against you. Man, you want to know why Easter matters? Man, of everything that people promise that God is doing for you. Paul says, you want to know what God has been at work providing for you? Forgiveness, a pardon for your failures, a release from your guilt, a pathway away from your shame, away from your worry. Look what else he says. Gives you forgiveness of sins, is proclaimed to you. Man, I am just excited. I'm going through the streets to let everyone know what God's providing. Man, everyone's talking about all these promises of God. No one's talking about forgiveness. All the guilt, all the worry, all the failures. Man, what Jesus did on Easter, it's all forgiven. Verse 39, and through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things. Man, freed from all things. That term freed means you're declared righteous, fully acquitted, or in a right, right relationship with God. There's no more burdens. No more separations. No more reasons for you to feel guilty. No more issues. No more rules and regulations. Man, you are freed. You want to know the power of Easter. It's forgiveness of sins. I was... As a young man, I tried so hard. I was raised in a Christian family, church culture. I was taught about the sacrifice of Jesus. That Jesus left heaven so he could take on the form of his own creation so that he can die for me. And man, that just made me feel guiltier. Not only am I a sinner, but Jesus had to leave the comfort of his home to come and suffer and die for me. Great. And so I spent my life trying to repay God. I felt like I had to live differently. And I was always feeling guilty because I never lived up to the expectations that God had for me. As I grew older, I felt like I had to work harder than everybody else. I always felt guilty that I could never go to the Lord with a pure heart because I always felt like oh, I could have done something more. Early in my ministry, 
Man, I would sacrifice heaven and earth to serve God's people. Not because I love them, but because I felt like I had to do something to repay God. Paul says, that's the power of Easter. What Jesus has accomplished for you is not just a forgiveness of sins, but a freedom for life. No more guilt. No more shame. No No more Hail Marys. You can go boldly to the throne of grace and confidence knowing that God will hear you Love how Paul says it in Romans. It says this, but God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know that. When you were at your worst, God had a plan for you. When culture's at their worst, God has a plan for them. Well, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul continues, he says, for if we were, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Years after the first Easter occurred, Paul found himself surrounded by people, I think similar to our culture today. Majority of them believed in Jesus' life. Majority of them had heard about Jesus' death. Majority of them had actually even probably heard and believed in the resurrection. But they didn't know why it mattered. As a result, Paul gave one of his most powerful sermons, one of my favorites. Not only let him know God has always had a plan. But that plan was fulfilled in Easter. And now we have a choice. Here's what the choice is. Look at the first, uh, the first three words of verse 40. It says, therefore take heed. Because of God's plan and what he did, take heed. Consider this opportunity. Make a change in your life. Accept the gift of forgiveness. Receive your freedom today. That term, take heed. Don't go another Easter. Don't just put it aside. Take heed. Take it to heart. Make a change in your life as a result of what Jesus has accomplished at Easter. You have a choice. My question for you then is this. Have you received forgiveness of sins? Man, that's what Easter's about. It's not just about family. It's not just about church. It's not just celebrating that Jesus rose. It's why Jesus rose. God has always had a plan to bring a blessing to you that no one else can bring. Forgiveness of sins. Freedom that you can't get from anywhere else. Not even the Constitution can provide freedom to you the way that Jesus provides freedom. Paul looked at those people as I'm going to look at you now. Take heed. Let that sink in and make a choice. My suspicion is many of you, based on those who wear suits, you've already made this choice. Brian, I've chosen this. Every Easter I'm coming, I'm ready to celebrate. We eat ham as a family in the afternoon in order to celebrate this movement of God. Like I have freedom to have bacon. Amen, I bring it. Hallelujah. Here's my question for you. If you have already taken heed and you have already received the glory of God in your life, my question is, who in your life needs to hear this sermon of Paul? Over 60% of Americans, that's not even talking about the rest of the world. 60% of, over 60% of Americans, they may know about Easter, but they don't know why it matters. So those of you who are here to celebrate the forgiveness of your sins, who is one person in your life, that you need to make sure that they know why Easter matters. Why Easter is so important. But in case there's someone here who has yet to receive the forgiveness of sins. 
You've been celebrating the activity of God, but you didn't know why it mattered to you. Where you feel like you're distant from God, you're ashamed to go in the presence of God. Where you feel like you have these rules and regulations over your life in order to somehow hopefully please God. The power of Easter is freedom for you, forgiveness of your failures, past, present, and future. And enables you to have a clear relationship, an open relationship with Jesus. Paul's message for you is take heed. Don't let another Easter go by without experiencing forgiveness. Life with Jesus. A complete freedom from guilt and shame and a new life that's provided to you through Jesus Christ himself. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we are here, God, many of us, because we do believe in your power. We look back in our lives, God, and we recognize that you have been moving through history to orchestrate your plan. And God, we confess to you that there's times where we feel that you have lost control. And there's times in our life where we don't understand what you are doing. But God, we confess to you that we know that you have been orchestrating your plan throughout time. And Jesus, many are here to celebrate what you have completed at Easter. That what you have promised came true. What you've provided is real. So God, for many of us who've already received it and are here today to just celebrate what you have accomplished God, my prayer for those people is that you would give them one name. Open their eyes and help them to see one person in their life that you have placed in their life for a particular reason to hear the good news of Easter. God, we know in our culture we're surrounded by people who may be celebrating the right things and doing the right things, but God, they have no idea why it matters. God, give us a name, give us one person that we can proclaim your truth to, just as Paul did so many years ago. God, for those people here, who have yet to experience the power of Easter. God, they know what it is about. But they have yet to experience your forgiveness. They've yet to receive your freedom. God, they know they're separated from you. They know they continue to feel this guilt and shame because they have not yet received your forgiveness, your payment. So God, I pray You'll open their eyes and allow them to see their heart as you do. God, may you give them courage and humility to repent of their failures to you. God, may you give them confidence enough to come to your throne and ask for your your payment, your forgiveness, your freedom. Jesus, I pray that you respond as you've promised. That you would hear their prayer. You would forgive them their failures. You would declare them righteous. You would set them free. And Jesus, I pray that you'd give them your Holy Spirit as you've promised. And that this work that is beginning in their life today will continue to grow throughout their life. God, that you would lead them and guide them in your name's sake. You would grow them in righteousness. Okay, you draw them closer to you as they pursue you more and more. God, this Easter, God, we're here today, whether for the hundredth time or the first time, to celebrate not just all the things you did, but what you accomplished on that Easter so many years ago. God, may you not only remind us about it, but may you empower us through it And may we proclaim it to all who will listen. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we respond to God's word? Like me, for I want to.
was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. celebrate Easter this day with new energy and new empowerment 
a new celebration, not just in your life, but to those who are around it. Today, you're here, you made a decision for Christ, you made some sort of commitment, we would certainly love to hear about it. And it, there's a couple ways you can respond. We're like, Brian, we gotta go, we have an Easter ham, an Easter roast going, we have to go, we have plans. I get it, if you can take a moment, fill out a card and a seat back in front of you. Just give it to ushers as you leave. That'll give me an opportunity to pray for you a member of our team to respond to you this week. If you came with a need, you came with a burden, you want to talk to someone, pray with someone in just a moment, friends of mine will be under the crosses. These are people I know and trust. If you have a burden, please don't leave without giving them an opportunity to pray with you, walk with you, and maybe even meet it for you. If you're visiting us today, we'd certainly love to share what we think God is doing, not just in our midst, but throughout the Chino Valley. And a member of our team will be in the lobby as you leave. We have a gift for you, ready to answer any questions that you have. Just a few reminders as you leave. Um, youth, so fifth grade, sixth grade, junior high, high school, we had this awesome youth zone planned for you outside, but Jesus didn't like it, evidently, and so now it's inside. So if you are here, fifth grade through high school, our youth team is going to be in room four. If you have no idea where room four is, just go through these double doors and follow the hall to your right. Listen for the cacophony of noise. They will be there. So youth, just through this, these double doors and go around and you can meet your leaders there. If this is your church home, I want to encourage you and remind you just continue to find a group smaller than this. If you need help finding a small group, Please join us. Finally, on your way out is our new sermon series. Samuel, First and Second Samuel, Searching for the True King. This is going to be a year-long study. Yeah, I know. That's a long time. <laughs> but here's why. Years and years ago, the people of God made a choice where they rejected God as their king and they pursued a king of man instead. And what it set into action is two books worth, a year-long study of pain and calamity brought upon themselves when they chose man as their king instead of God. I'd love to invite you to join us. As always, we have these great sermon guides who are right for you to, to give you some introductory material and to follow along with the study. So as you leave, this is your gift and ushers will have it for you. Otherwise, we love you. Before you go, can you just take a moment, get names of people around you, make sure they know God loves them and you love them too. All right, God bless you. Happy Easter. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.